Afternoon. Uh, my name's uh, Dave Knight. I'm the head coach of Do3 Coaching and um, this is going to be the first of our live question and answer sessions on uh, on YouTube. Um, so the purpose of this really is to just give you an opportunity to fire some, some questions over that have been uh, burning in your mind and see if we can uh, see if we can sort a few of those out for you. Um, the idea really is to try and do this, try and do it as frequently as possible. Um, if not, uh, certainly try and do it every week at least. So hopefully make it your kind of go-to place if you've got any questions that you want to you want to kind of get answered. So um, hope you find it hope you find it useful. Now if you're uh, if you are watching, um, just feel free to send some questions across on the comments on YouTube. Um, it should be at the bottom of the screen there somewhere, and they'll pop up on my screen, and I'll do my best to answer answer them for you. Um, not an expert on everything, but I'll try and have a have a have a shot. And if I haven't got a clue, then I'll let you know, and uh, we'll try and send some links or figure out how we're going to get those questions answered for you. So. Again, hopefully you'll you'll find it useful. Now, some of the guys have uh, from the squad have already sent me some questions in. Um, so the first one is from Joe Granger, um, who's a member of the squad here, asking my comments about um, tethered swimming, whether it's better than cord work or just different. Is it more likely to lead to bad habits? Now, there's obviously a lot of people using um, the temporary pools at the moment. Um, where they're, they're they're swimming in the back garden or wherever they're kind of they've got the pool situated, um, and they're tied up by by bands either to their to their ankles or to their to their waists. Now, um, it's a difficult one to answer really, and as always with these things, um, it's it's a different answer for different people really. My main concern with um, some swimmers swimming tethered in a pool is that it can it can affect the way you move in the water. Obviously, it will affect the way you move because you're you're tied up. Um, now, swimming is all about repetition and muscle memory, and obviously doing the same thing over and over again. And my only concern with tethered swimming really is that if you're being um, held in held around the waist or wherever your tether happens to be, I'd suggest the waist would be a better place. Um, but if you're being held in that position, it's stopping your movement. There's a little bit of um, obviously restriction there, which is going to stop you moving freely, which is then going to make you adapt the way you move your arms and and and, and recover over the water and actually take that stroke. Um, and of course, if you're doing that again and again and again, you could arguably be affecting your stroke because you're drilling yourself to move in a different way in the pool. Now, when you get back in the water, that may affect you, it may not. It depends how long you've been doing it for. Um, it's 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 going to be different for different people. So if you, all I would say is, if you are going to be using um, a pool, a tethered uh, tethered in a pool, then you've got to really try and think about making that swim stroke as close and as realistic as possible. If you think if the water is too shallow or it's too narrow and you're restrict, restricting your stroke or something like that because of it, then I would steer clear of it. You can do the bulk of um, uh, what you can do um, in a in a tethered in a pool poolside. You can use bands to um, to uh, mimic the the entry point of the water at the entry at the entry point at your hands at the front of the stroke. The push down there and then the high elbow and the push back. Um, if you can rig yourself up on a weights bench or something like that, you can actually also get a little bit of rotation in there as well. Um, and you can use something like a Swiss ball even. If you've got the kind of the balance and the core strength, you could lie on a Swiss ball. And then you can even rotate while you're using the, um, the arms um, with the stretch cords. So that's my kind of take on it really. Um, Logically, um, if you're a better swimmer, you're more likely to be able to hold good form tethered. Um, I'm not sure how newer swimmers and not so um, not so well developed um, uh, freestyle swimmers would handle being tethered in a pool. It's really hard work at first, and it will throw your breathing out, put your heart rate up. So. Um, I would suggest you'd find more experienced swimmers get a little bit more benefit out of it than 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 those who aren't. Um, best thing to do really is to try it, and ideally, even better still, get someone who knows what your stroke should look like to actually look at you while you're swimming. Even if it's just a video clip, 
get your partner to, send to take a video of, of you and send it to your coach and just say, do you think it's okay? Um, what you don't want to do is spend six weeks practicing a shocking stroke for an hour a day and then get back in the pool and not really have achieved anything. Um, so that's just some, some things to think about there as far as tethered swimming goes. Um, I've got a question from... I'm going to ask a question from Grant Grant Marshall asking about the uh, the client the Kilmet app on Strava. Grant, uh, so what Grant's asking is the Kilmet app is an app which brings in the weather to your Strava activities on. So if you look at Strava, it'll have your workout, and underneath the Kilmet app will bring in the weather on that particular day. It will capture it from from its own sources and bring it in. Um, I actually had it set up on my phone, and to be honest with you, Grant, I can't remember how I did it. So I'll speak to you. I'll speak to you separately. Maybe drop you a message, and we'll figure it out together. But there's certainly a, certainly a nice, simple way of, of doing that. Um, message from Michael Griffiths uh, about rocker plates. Now, I did say if I don't know anything about something, I'll tell you. And rocker plates, um, I know what they are, but I don't really know much about them. They're a fairly new addition to um, to the tri world and the cycling world. Um, I assume you're talking, Michael, about the plates that your turbos can sit on and things like that, just so as you get a bit more movement. Um, I don't know a huge amount about them. I think, um, logically speaking, if anything can make the cycle and the movement of the bike a little bit more realistic, I can't necessarily see that being a bad thing. Um, I don't know. I'd have to do some research on that, Michael, and, and have a look. If anyone, any of you guys who are watching have got any comments on, on rocker plates yourselves, then obviously feel free to uh, feel free to interject. But uh, that's something that's uh, now you brought it up, Michael. I shall go away and, and, and do a little a little bit of digging uh, into that and find out a little bit more about them myself. But they haven't come up. Um, we've got we've got lots of athletes. Um, and I don't know of anyone who uses them, to be quite honest with you. I'm sure there are some some um, some people out there, but uh, I don't know anybody that uses them at the moment. But then again, they are they are very new. Um, got a message coming on Facebook from Ben. Afternoon, Ben. Looking to improve getting into the aero position. I can hold the power, but can't stay down for long. Yeah, that's that's quite common actually. Um, usually something to do with the bike setup and the way. Um, you're actually going to be sitting on the bike um, and also a combination of that and flexibility as well. So if the bike setup isn't right and your bike, you're having to get too far down at the front end to comfortably get aero, then you're not going to be in an actual position, you're not going to be in a comfortable position, you're not going to be able to deliver any power. Um, so it's going to be a combination of things of um, raising the front end or changing the uh, kind of setup at the front end a little bit. But equally, I suspect there's a little bit of lack of flexibility in the lower back there. So you have to do some um, some flexibility work there. But in simple terms, the best thing to do really initially is just take the um, take the bars up at the front end a little bit um, until you get more comfortable. And then over time, you'll get used to that position. Your back will start to stretch out and you'll be able to drop that down a little bit. The best thing to do is to, uh, is to have a word um, with somebody who knows what they're doing about bike fitting. Okay, so go to your local. Um, well, the best thing to do is uh, this is quite a difficult one. Bike fitters who you can rely upon and who can trust um, are. Uh, I was going to say are few and far between. They're not. There are some good ones out there, but the best thing to do is to speak to your club mates, ask around, and find out who the local one is that people recommend. Um, don't just go to any old person that you find in the uh, in the in the di tri directory or whatever it is that you look at. So make sure that you. Um, you go to someone who's who's um, highly recommended. Um, obviously, at, at Do Three, we coach a particular style of riding, so we we do ask for people to um, to sit quite a long way forward on the saddle. We cycle in a kind of a push down motion. This is something for another discussion, maybe rather than circles. Um, so that does require a slightly different setup as well, because you're going to be sitting a little a little bit further forward. Um, my fear with some bike fitters is that they won't. They should ask the right questions and they should know what you're trying to get them to achieve. Um, but some may try and set you up as a pure time trialer and not understand the specifics of the change of position that would allow you to run well off the bike. Um, so there's some subtleties there. It's a bit of a minefield. Uh, and again, the best thing to do is speak to a coach that you trust um, and hopefully they should be able to advise you and point you in the right direction. So yeah, in simple terms, Play around with the front end, 
work on your back flexibility. Um, simple test for that really is to put your feet against the wall. So sitting on the floor with your legs straight, put your feet against the wall and just wrench, rest, um, stretch down your shins without kind of overstretching too far and see where you can naturally get to and just see over time. Um, I'll, post, I'll post some, uh, I'll make a note of this, I'll post some stretches onto the YouTube comments. Stretch comments, uh, sorry, stretch links. Uh, and over time, work on just extending forward and just see if you can get those fingertips a little bit down those shins uh, in simple terms, just kind of ex expanding your ability to kind of reach out, um, reach out, reach forward and expand that, to stretch out that lower back, sorry, I should say. Um, right, what else have we got? So we've got a question that came in on Instagram. Let's have a look at this one. So um, this is a question from Vivio Barardi. God knows how you pronounce that. I hope that's at least close. Um, could you recommend good kit for indoor biking? Um, well, in terms of brands and things, no, not really. We don't really work with, um, apart from Yonder, of course, <laughs> we do uh, We do get our kit from Yonder, but more generally, um, general sports kit, um, we, we don't recommend any particular brands. All I'd say really with that is that you need to make sure that you are um, got some good quality bike shorts, so with a pad in them, um, and you wear technical clothing really because indoors it's going to get hot um, make sure you've got a fan ideally as well a lot of people doing indoor training at the moment just get a fan um, put it in front of you and it's going to make the whole thing a whole lot easier so um, not a huge amount of detail on that for you unfortunately but um, no just some just some good quality um, moisture wicking kit um, and some padded bike shorts when I first started cycling I didn't even know padded bike shorts existed so it's not until someone tells you these things that um, that you know they're actually they're actually out there and also with indoor biking make sure you stay well hydrated because you are going to be uh, losing quite a lot of uh, quite a little liquid through through um, through sweating and things so um, just be just be careful be careful with that um, not sure if anyone's got any more questions coming in I did get a question from Tony um, about intensity factors in training peaks so if any of you got any questions on training peaks um, I don't propose to do a full detailed kind of uh, an, um, run through of training peaks I know training peaks pretty well we use it all the time but um, there's some geeks out there who, who know the system a whole lot better than I do but I certainly know the basics I think what I'll try and do is if I can um, share my screen let's just see if I can go into a little bit of detail on this for you just give me two seconds uh, right let's just go on to that and see if we can get training peaks up. Uh, where are we? Let's just pick any old workout. Okay, so there we go. So hopefully you can see my hopefully you can see my screen there. Just make this a little bit bigger because I can actually see what I'm see what I'm looking at. So what I'm talking about here are the um, are the numbers up here. Um, so Tony was asking what the IF means here. You can just about hopefully see that on the screen. So IF stands for intensity factor. Now it can be quite complicated to explain this sometimes, but um, the the most simple way of thinking about this is if you were to get an IF of one, so an IF of one point zero zero. That would be the maximum amount of work that you could do in one hour. Okay, so if you rode, if you did a one-hour workout, and you got an, an IF of 1.00, that would mean that you, as long as your data is set in there properly, your thresholds, uh, threshold is set in there properly, um, and your power zones are set up, and all that kind of thing, then um, that should mean that you are. That's the maximum. That you are able to output in that particular at that particular hour okay so the best the simple way of thinking about it is percentages so 0.89 is 89 percent so 89 percent so which sounds like you know it's a hard it's a decent hard effort or it's kind of it's almost nine out of ten effort all right so if that was an aerobic ride for example so a two hour zone two aerobic ride that would be too hard that would be too hard. That would be more what I would expect to see on a kind of a standard distance to a sprint distance triathlon, um, that kind of effort. So a really hard but yet sustainable 
pace. Once you start getting up to 95% and one, sorry, 95% or 0.95 IF, then you're getting up towards um, up towards your um, your your maximum effort for that particular hour. You can go over. So if you do um, uh, if you were to do 20 minutes, absolutely, you know, flat out, you might get an IF of 1.2, something like that, 120%. But of course, you wouldn't be able to do that for an hour. Um, so another thing I see very often is, um, and when the figures aren't set up right, if you do a two-hour ride and you have an IF of one, then there's something there's something amiss there because you shouldn't be capable of holding an IF of one, which is your maximum for one hour, holding that for two hours. You shouldn't be capable of doing that. All right, so there's obviously a bit of a discrepancy. If you see that popping up, um, you can certainly do it under an hour, um, but if you go over an hour, you shouldn't have an IF of more than one. If you have, then your um, your thresholds and things are set up incorrectly on Training Peak. So have a look at that. Um, just while we're just while we're here on Training Peaks, um, I'll run through a few more of these in a bit more detail. So VI uh, is variability index. Now, what that means is that's the difference between your average power and your normalized power. Um, so average power is your true average power um, as the power meter would read it through for say say an hour's time. Um, the variability, so you, you, the variability is the amount of um, surging um, that you may see within that that you, there may be within that uh, that hours that term, that time period. So a VI of 1.00 means the road is completely constant. It's completely you know level effort all the way through. So usually the VIs, or they should be, over one. So it should be one point something. Um, the higher you get, is the higher you get, then um, the more kind of spiky and surgy the ride is. Now, on this particular ride, so the average power is 206, um, and the normalized power is 245. So what you'll find is if the VI is high, the difference between the average power and the normalized power will be bigger, will be higher. If the VI is 1.00, then they pretty, they'll be pretty much the same number, the average power and the normalized. So you can see how the normalized power, which is also on the screen there, NP, is giving, it's, it's, it's trying to give you a true reflection of the actual workload that your body has done during that time. The average may only be 206, but because of the spiking and the extra effort and energy that takes to generate those surges, um, your body is actually kind of almost given 245 watts worth of power. Um, and this is particularly important for uh, for athletes who are who are going kind of longer distance um, and you want to try and avoid as many surges as possible and try and keep that intense that, that variability index fairly low. For uh, for longer distance athletes, depending on the circumstances, the type of race, the course, how competitive it is. Um, we generally recommend that VI should be between 1.05 and 1.1 or maybe 1.15. So the margins are quite small, but good experience coaches should be able to look at those numbers and recognize what the differences mean. You know, I know that 1.5 is, is quite, a, quite a spiky ride. There's a lot of power surges in there. Um, uh, and obviously 1.00 is nice and, nice and, nice and even. Um, so normalized power just touched on there. So that's the kind of the, the real true true um, reflection of how much power, how much work you've been doing, and how much kind of effort level your body is undertaking to make that work. Uh, what's, what else have we got there? Uh, what's uh, elevation gain and loss? That's pretty straightforward. Just your climbing distances or um, the amount of feet you've you've gained and lost during that particular ride. Um, grade is the average percentage for the ride. VAM, I'd have to look that one up. Can't remember what that one is now. It's certainly not something that I use. Uh, watts per kilo. Well, this is down to if the uh, if the athlete has um, their weights plumbed into training peaks, it should be able to work out what the rough uh, watts per kilo, how many, what the um, the power you've generated per kilogram of body weight for that particular ride. And once you get into a little bit deeper into this stuff, you kind of be able to work out whether or not that's a that's a good amount of a good power to weight ratio for that particular type of ride. Um, so I think we'll uh, we'll leave it there. Otherwise, we can go on all day about training peaks. And we'll do a separate session about training peaks at some other point, and I'll, I'll dig out the bits and bobs that I'm not quite sure of myself. Because I say we don't use all of this. There's a lot of information in training peaks, and you pick and choose what you pick and choose what you um, you use there. 
Um, Jez has asked a question. What do you think about heart rate variability monitors to help prevent overtraining? If not, what are the symptoms I should watch out for? For overtraining, well, where do we start? Okay, it's quite a big one. So heart rate variability monitors. I used to have one of those about 15 years ago. I had a Sunto watch which used to measure heart rate variability. And I must say it's been a while since I've, I've been a while since I've looked at that. And my understanding of it is that um, it actually measures the distance between the kind of the heartbeat, the end of one heartbeat and the start of the next, or something like that. It's been a while since I've I've looked at it. And that that time period, the variability between the heart then the heart rhythm is can be measured to um to 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 try and give an estimation about how how fatigued you are and how well you recovered you are so provided you have um a reliable way of measuring that uh and a, a reliable system of interpreting that then yeah surely it can certainly be it can certainly be useful it's not something i use particularly in coaching myself because i generally speak to my athletes quite a lot and I'd rather get um, verbal feedback from them and rely on their kind of the feel and their perception about how training is going rather than actually kind of relying on tech. Um, I think you can get a little bit too reliable on uh, on gadgets and, and, and tech um, sometimes. So that's one of the reasons we don't, we don't use them. Um, but uh, thanks, Ben. Need to stop sharing my screen. What would I do without you? Let's see if we can get this back on here. Uh, let's go back to this. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, yeah, so uh, so variability monitors. Uh, yeah, we don't use them particularly, but they they can be they can be useful. Um, Jez, if you want to have a chat to myself or Corin about that at some point, then we can we can have a, another separate chat about that. Symptoms of overtraining. Well, they're they're wide ranging really. Um, lack of sleep. Um, you can get stressed and irritable. You can lose your mojo, you know, you just kind of lose drive and determination a little bit. Um, you may go off your food, you may feel unwell, you might kind of get aches and pains, you may not be recovering from training sessions in time. Depending on the degree of, of overtraining um, and the different people react in different ways, um, then again the best thing to do is to kind of speak to your coach and try and interpret um, what's going on but they're the kind of the key ones really um a really big one which i just mentioned there is the kind of is the irritability and the lack of kind of loss of drive and motivation so i quite often see athletes who will um get to the end of a training block and they'll say it's oh it's going it's going really badly it's going terribly oh, i'm really weak this that and the other um and I know full well it's because they're tired. It's not because they're actually getting weaker. Um, it's still be it's, a, it's a mental thing. Um, the brain starts to take over a little bit because the brain, you start to skew how you think when you start to get too fatigued. Um, so it's time to get some time to get some rest. But yeah, any of those things that I mentioned before can be symptoms of overtraining. But again, um, a good coach should be somebody that you can speak to. If you haven't got your own coach, just speak to speak to a club coach and just talk these things through. Sometimes, just it, when you say these things out loud, it obviously it just it just it becomes sounds obvious. You know, sometimes when you speak these things, uh, they talk these things through with people. Um, so yeah, that's that's the symptoms of overtraining. Um, Jez, I know you're. Uh, Obviously, being coached by uh, by Corin at the moment. Speak to Corin. Um, I'm sure you have already uh, about that. So if you've got any more any more questions about that, then give us give us a shout. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I haven't any more questions come in. Um, so we're going to say to try and do this every week. Um, I'm going to get me a bit more um, a bit more skillful at doing the operating. So this is the first few uh, live broadcasts we've done. So we're we're getting there. Um, so a little bit about a little bit about do three just before I finish off. Then we're um, um, we're a triathlon um, squad based in Warwickshire in the West Midlands. So we're a, we're an open squad, so we're we're open to members uh, of other clubs to come along. We're not an affiliated club. We're kind of open. We're not an official club, um, so all of our sessions can be put alongside um, your existing training sessions. Um, we're doing a lot more online, so and again, anyone's welcome to drop us questions or comment on any of the things that we do, particularly on YouTube and, and platforms like that, because uh, we try and help as many people, many people as possible. Um, so our squad, we've got about 200 members in the squad, active members. We run swimming sessions every day, uh, apart from Sunday, 
and a really good active kind of community group. So that's us. Um, I've done a video about myself, so I won't go through telling you all about me, but um, I'll put a link in uh, in the post down below. And so you can have a click on uh, a click on, on that if you want to find out about a little bit more about me and the rest of rest of do three, but uh, genuinely here to help. So I hope some of you have found these these questions uh, at least uh, reasonably helpful and interesting. Um, uh, last thing, if you found it useful, then please subscribe because we're going to be sending out uh, some really good quality content. We've just started doing this over the last week or so, so um, it's only going to get better. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll call it a day there. There's nothing else has come in. So thanks. Nice to see you and um, see you next time.